think uh, I think everybody's here is here for the moment. Uh, hi everyone, um, welcome. Our speaker today is uh, Dr. Michelle Serpentine. Michelle's been through a very interesting experience in adapting to lockdown and, and training. So we've been asked her to come and talk today. Michelle has been associated with the ASPSA since the beginning of time, I think, Michelle. Am I right? Yeah, yeah it feels like that. It's <laughs> been around for a while, hey? <laughs> yeah. So everybody, you know the rules. Please, um, please engage with us, but do that through the chat box. Um, so if you have any questions, or any comments, or any thoughts that you want to share with us, please type them in there. <clears throat> then I will interact with Michelle directly, and I'll interrupt her as needed. Ah. Uh, to pose those questions to her. The idea is that it should be a conversation. So yes. please don't be, feel shy to, to talk to us and to raise something. Michelle, do you want to go ahead and share your screen and let's get going? Yeah, let me do that. I, it's lovely to be here. And I do want to say, if you hear a bit of noise, it's just, I'm in the restaurant at the moment because the Wi-Fi is better here. And um, yeah, I hopefully there won't be too much. Uh, so I'm looking forward to just sharing our experience with you. So please feel free to interrupt. I'm a mom of two and I work with my husband, so you must know interruption and I have staff that interrupt me all the time. So please feel free to interrupt as we go along. So um, we've moved to Amanis. We moved in 2018 from Joburg and we bought an ocean basket. And that was a massive it's very interesting, very pleased we did it, but I tell you at the time, overwhelming. So what I want to share with you, is the joy of being part of a franchise, is that you get exposed to different experience, what you would if it was your own restaurant. I'm very thankful for the franchise. I am speaking as a franchise owner, and a small business owner in a small uh, tourist-based seaside town that went through COVID. Um, just to give you a bit of background, we go over on the 1st of March, 2018. We were at that stage in a different building and the building you see behind on this slide is where we are now. We're now in Station Square on the main road. Um, that's where we are right now. When we arrived, we had 50 staff and we had to reduce the staff complements because in the week, in the year that we were there, we had um, protests, which meant our whole staff was prevented from coming into work. And um, what happened is that we had to then get smarter and start working more tightly. During lockdown last year, we were closed for eight months. From March, we only opened again at the end of November. And our season starts in December. So it was quite a um, learning curve we had to go through. Um, and then just understanding that because of lockdown, we experienced um, a decrease in sales of between 40 and 60 percent, obviously uh, from March to November it was naught. Um, and we didn't open for takeaways simply because we just we had a fallout with our landlord. That's why we moved. So since then, we've actually done quite well because the, the new um, restaurant that we're in is much better placed and much tighter controls. And we move basically from 180 seater restaurant to 100 seater restaurant. With lockdown level three, we're only allowed to have, um, in July, we were only allowed to have 50 people inside, including our staff. And we're still limited in terms of that restriction. We're allowed to have 44 guests at a time because we usually have about six and sometimes more over weekends. So we're really strict about that because people are very aware of health and safety at this time. Just to give you context, I think I've shared some of this in terms of the learning strategy and how it works. And I don't know if any of you have been in restaurants and would be interesting to know if any of you work with restaurants because I can't imagine um, that restaurants, unless they're part of a bigger entity would have a firm l and strategy in place. But our advantage of being part of a franchise is that we actually have this hot head office um, infrastructure in place. I'm going to explain a little, speak a little bit about that because we don't have lots of time. 
And I really would love to have your questions. Um, what's interesting though about our uh, training, as you can imagine, we're a small team and in a restaurant, you're doing training daily. Um, you do daily training and then you do bigger training in terms of uh, specific changes. So for instance, we change our menu twice a year and then we need the whole team back of house and front of house to understand the changes. Our, our grillers, our filleters to understand how to make the meals and then our waiters how to sell the meals. We work with mainly unskilled and semi-skilled people, um, which is very interesting, a big challenge to go from a corporate environment where you're working with professionals who have qualifications and then being limited, or not limited, but exposed to an unskilled and semi-skilled team. Great challenges there. Just to give you a bit of background, some of you might know the Ocean Basket brand. Um, it was established in 1995. It's first store in Menland where people were really bringing their own wine and uh, baskets and eating very basic food. And now we more than 200 restaurants, 144 of those restaurants in South Africa. And they're starting to grow the global footprint um, slowly because I think that there are lots of challenges in delivering a similar experience in a franchise across the world where you've got different influences. So our values are really generosity, commitment to everyday value for money and our love of sharing. So you'll see in the restaurants, for instance, we don't have TVs, no TVs in Ocean Basket because it is supposed to be a place where you enjoy your meals in a Greek sort of way with your um, family or guests. I thought this was such a true statement. We have all been looking at digital transformation, considering it, um, looking at different options, maybe um, dipping a bit into digital transformation. And then we were hit by COVID and lockdown, hard lockdown, and suddenly we had to, whether we liked it or not, just transform. Um, and just I lecture online at MBA level with marketing sales students, and last night we were speaking about the fact that's where um, a lot of platforms had to build a lot of trust with customers because they were wary of um, getting into this digital online platform. Now we're all in it, whether we like it or not. And those who are struggling have had to find support in terms of Zooms and how it works and so on. I, I'm wondering, Andy, because I see you very quiet, I'm wondering if you have any questions. No, I mean, I, I just, and nobody's made any comments in the chat box so far, but I mean, I think this is such a powerful slide. It so summarizes it for me too. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah. And I, you know, it's just changed our life. And I think we, we almost, last year we were still speaking about when we go back to normal. I think this year we've realized, okay, this is the new normal. This is how it works. And this is, it's going to be like this for a while. So it's actually quite interesting. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about and share with you is on this slide. Um, so let's just look at before and after. So in the ocean basket, when we arrived in 2017, we went through obviously some of the orientation. We had to be approved as a franchisee and we had to go through training in 2018. And we got a file. So it was a paper-based effort and we had to be in the restaurant. So it's in the workplace, which is great and very hands-on and your assessments were paper-based. So it was really quite an inflexible um, system and being in an environment where I'd experienced so many different interfaces, it was quite an eye-opener. Um, and there's no incentive really to compete. So whether you did the assessment or not, you didn't, you sort of knew at least you were on the right track, but there was no recognition reward type of system. Then in 2018, um, Grace Harding had recently taken over as the CEO. She's been with Ocean Basket for a while, but her um, exposure was in leadership development. And that brought a whole different flavor to Ocean Basket. And we've seen in the last four years, this transformation of Ocean Basket into a more corporate 
based animal. Um, and so the efforts were to try and make the learning and development accessible to semi-skilled and unskilled workers. Luckily for us, most of our workers are on their phones all the time, or unlucky for us. So you know, it depends how you look at it. So we first went to an app, and the app was quite interactive, but it was more about pushing content and um, then getting us to check whether we we're on board and we just did a little assessment at the end. But again, no interaction and quite, um, uh, what you say, quite um, set in terms of how you went through the process. Then the app changed and they started inclu including, they went to a different platform and they started including little videos and a little bit of gaming so that you would choose which courses you were on. And as you went through the processes, you were given little medals and recognized and you could see your progress. There was a little diagram. I don't have any of that that I can show you, but it was quite interesting because now you sort of got engaged and you could connect and there was incentive to be engaged. And now we're on the third iteration of the training, of the digital training. And this is lovely. And I just thought what I'll show you and I'll, revisit the slide, but just the interface. So what I've done for those of you sitting with your cell phones, sitting on your laptop, and you can still see on your um, cell phone, I put a QR code so that you can just scan it and go to the um, website. But this is what you'll see when you go to our academy. And what's so lovely about this, I just want to see, because I'm struggling, um, I just want to try and get so I can see the screen. Um, some, not all, of the training that's delivered through Ocean Basket is services to be accredited. So the effort there is ultimately to be able to offer a full qualification. But I think at this stage, it's really about getting the content up and then ultimately offering um, short learning programs and then going for the qualification. So that you do have this lifelong learning, you support that, and you support um, this notion of progression articulation. What's very nice about the system is you can see your progress. It's an instant feedback system. You can go back. So if there are little videos, there's the capacity to reverse, um, revisit, click on the screen, see, you know, they are, it's quite interactive. And it's quite small because a lot of our, um, staff who complete the training would do it on their phones. They wouldn't be doing it on their laptop like you and I are speaking now. Michelle, um, yeah. Michelle, so a yes. couple of questions. One from me is yes. how, what was the reaction of the, of the learners to having to do stuff on, it's, it's on their own phones, hey? Yeah. Is that a hard sell? So I want to tell you what works very well because we are, I'm watching all my staff gathering outside. On Fridays, we do a deep clean. And that is the time when we, we do, we introduce anything new and we have everyone in the room. And then what we sit is we say, we've got Wi-Fi in the restaurant. We get everyone on their phone to say, right now, you all log in. I'm right here. Let me sit with you. Let me log in. Let me go through. So it's, it is a hard sell, but uh, no, it's actually not such a hard sell. Sorry, I'm contradicting myself, but um, it's accessible. And what I assumed that I've got all these millennials and these uh, Generation Z, and I'm like, they don't know how to read QR codes with their phones. They don't know how mm. to log into things. So yeah. what I'm enjoying, and I'm hoping that I'm answering your question, is once we've got everyone in the room, once we've got their phones up, then we're actually getting them logged in and they can see the benefit of that. And then it's just to drive it, you know, on a daily, week by week, monthly basis and to get the reports from head office so that we can see who's engaging and who's participating. So the, so the deal is they're using the company Wi-Fi. Yeah. So it's not costing them. And no. what about people who don't have a, a phone that can access it? So what we do, and 
this is a new thing that started with Ocean Basket. We just this week we've spent, um, we've introduced Jolt, which is a health and safety system online, and it helps us to do online reporting and so on. So part of that initiative, we actually have an iPad from head office. Um, and I was amazed that they actually did that. And the academy is actually loaded onto this iPad. So what can happen, and I want to tell you, of my 20-odd staff, most of them are able to go online because it's not an app, because it's actually online. They don't have to download an app. It doesn't have to be compatible with their phones. They can just go onto their browser and they can start interacting. Doesn't take storage and data of their phones. Mm -hmm. So most of my stuff, I actually haven't got anyone who's come to me and said, "Sorry, I can't. I don't have a phone." So that's been fantastic. Okay. Now there are three more uh, questions or comments <clears throat> as well. So let's tackle them now. Firstly, I'll go through them all, and then we can go back to each in turn. Firstly, John Arneson said, "Can you talk about the unexpected benefits of online training?" Number two, people say online training is fundamentally different face-to-face. -face. Can you talk to this? And Vimo Mayo is saying, what are the cost implications for a small provider to transition from face-to-face -face online? Rough estimate. So let's just go back mm -hmm. over the first one. Can you talk a bit about the unexpected benefits of online training? So that one of them, thanks, John, for that question. Um, one of the unexpected benefits is that everyone, it's accessible. So... There's no excuse now. People can't um, now say to me, sorry, you know, I can't access it. I don't have a book. I don't have this. So it's accessible to everyone. Everyone can benefit. Um, it also means you're upskilling your whole team simultaneously. And you've got a much prouder organizational culture. It's amazing. You know, I'm in. I'm able to participate. I'm not being excluded because I can't read and write or I can't, I don't, you know, how to do things. There's capacity. Um, I'm sure there are lots of other things, but uh, those are ones I can think of offhand. Then question two is, people say online training is fundamentally different to face-to-face. -face. Can you talk to this? Definitely. Um, I've experienced it not so much here as I have online with my students um, at Milkbox. I, what I saw, and I saw that in part of our discussions, remember Quarandella did a presentation and showed us a little bit of Moodle in the back end. And what I really admire about Quarand is she's and her teams have crafted this online experience. But what I've seen is a lot of people just taking their face-to-face uh, -face content and dumping it online and expecting people to be able to navigate the content and learn without being pulled through the process. So I think it's very different. The craft is different. The design in terms, if you just look at my slide here, it's much more visual. Um, and what's nice is you're including real life pictures. So you've got real life people that you might identify or situations that you might identify. Um, face to face is an opportunity for the person facilitating the trainer to pick up body language. That's one of the things I find Zoom <laughs> just takes away from us. Um, you can't read the room. You can't always read the mood in the room. And you can't, the facilitator, the craft there was to be able to uh, turn a whole session around and to change almost the atmosphere. In Zoom, you limit or whatever digital interface you're using, Moodle, uh, Microsoft Teams, whatever it is, I find the challenge there as facilitator is to engage and to connect with your audience. For instance, I, I was sharing with Andy earlier, I make my students show their faces before we start, just so I can see where they are. The one guy had his kids with, with him on his lap, you know, so it was that type of thing. And um, I found that was actually quite exciting and um, realizing that there is a craft in facilitating online. I hope that answers the question. 
Can I ask a follow up on there? Just so yes. you've spoken about bite sized chunks of learning. How long is a yes. bite sized chunk? Because I see often uh, workshops that are scheduled as two full days of online work. Um, and clearly, to my mind, that's too long. But then I see some of the sessions. Sorry, are say like that four, again. I lost I see, I see some sessions where it's two full days of online, an online training program. Uh, and that's very really clearly me. I, I think I would go mad. But then I see sessions of yes. up to four hours at a time. So, uh, for example, a CETA will run a forum for four hours. Um, and what's your take on a bite size chunk? What do you mean? What, what seems to work? So, um, so what I found, so it also depends on the environment. I see with my MBA students, they can digest quite a lot. So for them, a bite size chunk would be much bigger than one for my, one of my um, workers here at Ocean Basket. So what I would suggest, sorry, I just want to quickly stop. Um, stop people from coming inside so that you don't have this background noise. Um, so the bite-sized chunks we have are two to three minutes. So if you have a little video, that it's not even, it's maybe less than two minutes. And then you still have the ability to go backwards and forwards on the video. And sometimes I actually would sit with the video and realize this is too long, three minutes too long. Um, whereas online, um, our students, one of the things that I find works very well is um, discussions. So you raise a question and then you have a forum where students are able to post things and you give them certain criteria in terms of how they post. And then they're able to interact and you as facilitator of the conversation able to give them feedback. Yes, you're on the right track. What about this? Have you considered that? And it actually creates a learning opportunity. So what I'm hearing, uh, Michelle, what I'm hearing you say is uh, if it's information giving, you're going to be very careful about how long it is. But if you're yes. engaging them with an exercise where they participate, you can have a longer slot. Yes. Okay. Um, interesting, because John will also be sitting there thinking, I mean, his videos, I think, John, you might want to comment on that, are about 15 minutes, I think, or 20 minutes long. I don't know about you, but I struggle to sit and listen for that long. I would prefer to have almost interrupted videos, five minutes and then a break, five minutes and then a break, break, and then maybe have something where you actually have a little activity afterwards or you have notes that you're busy taking, you know, something that makes it more digestible. What I've realized, and you might have seen it in your own, those of you who are sitting and listening, we have learned to be interrupted all the time. I actually struggle to sit and watch a TV program uninterrupted. I actually sit on my phone while I'm watching the TV program. And I'm having to train myself um, to actually sit still. I don't know if you've had that experience. And now yes. I'm, yeah, it's, it's that disruption is actually, I don't know. I, I realized the other day again, and I thought, no. We actually have to retrain ourselves to read, to try digest things, to reflect, and yeah. Michelle, but the interesting thing is that neither you nor I are a millennial. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we adopted, yeah. eh? We yeah. adopted. <laughs> and maybe yeah, let's talk. Matters. Yeah. <laughs> let's just talk about Michelle uh, Vilma's question as well. What are the cost implications for a small provider to transition from face to face, a rough estimate? Are you able to comment on that or is it not your experience base? So I want to tell you, I haven't experienced it, but I do want to tell you, if you I, I've heard and interacted with people who've invested. And I mean, we have a very good system that's robust. And maybe John, you can answer this better than me or anyone else on the um, chat. A good system is going to cost you a few hundred thousand, if not more. It's a large investment. But I've also seen smaller interventions that work well. Um, and we can be quite creative. I've, um, while I, in the time I've been in Amonis, developed um, 
apps using visa.com. And I found that that has the ability, it's content based, but you have the ability to offer instant, you know, current information on your phone in um, digestible chunks. That's a free app. If you want to pay for it, it's one and a half thousand rand for the year. Now that's just the platform. So, and if you have people who are developing content, then obviously their costs involved there. So I think what's happened with us having access to so many different platforms, it's becoming more and more affordable. Moodle, Moodle is open source. So you're able to access it. And I actually started at one stage trying to trade myself up. It is a complex environment, but it's accessible and something that becomes affordable if you've got time to, to put your head around it. I mean, you've worked on Moodle as well, Andy. Yes, I have. And we ran a Moodle system and it did cost us uh, several hundred thousand rands to put together. Um, yeah. But maybe <clears throat> once you're done, let's put, maybe you can put in the chat box once you're done, Michelle, some of the, the, the systems that you've seen, anybody could look at it. Yeah. Um, okay. We only have about four minutes left. What, <laughs> what else do you want to say to us? So let me just show you quickly. I want to show this slide just so to get a sense. I, mean, I didn't know how much happened in a restaurant until I owned one. And it's, you know, you think it's just a quick training, but it's, there are a lot of people that need to be trained and you don't want to necessarily overtrain people. So you do want generalists that are flexible so that if you are put in lockdown again, you have that accessibility skills. Um, our sushi at the moment is our biggest lack because that's a different skill. And then just to show you in our environment, we have access to jobs which brings the online calendar to us. We have pilot as our front of sale. And then we're obviously trying to be a sustainable, um, a responsible ocean citizen. In terms of that, um, just to give you an idea of the technological base on which we work and the fact that there is complexities in terms of delivering learning and development. Um, I just wanted to show you, if you go into the course, you can actually see this because it's, um, if you go into that online system, they give you an about video. And this, these are the screenshots from that, what's it all about. And you can actually see how it's the interface and the look and feel of it. What's nice, it also gives a bit of a social environment. I'm not sure though, what the back end of this machine is. I don't know, it doesn't look like Moodle to me, but it could be. So I just thought it was interesting to see how they've adopted it. So that's what I really wanted to cover. I don't know if you have any other questions. Any comments or questions from anyone? Okay. Uh, while people are thinking, maybe Anjali, could you put up the link for the CPD points? Oh, that's me. No, I should actually do it. Oh, no, the, <clears throat> yeah, you can maybe, have you got those CPD points, the last two slides? You. Got them. Okay, let's have them up. <laughs> okay, and then Angie put... <laughs> no, I didn't do that. <laughs> um, so in the chat box is the link to actually get your CPD points if you want to do that. Um, and then maybe the, just the last slide, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, it's this one. I love that. Okay. So if you want to go and have a look at past sessions, and this session will also be uh, in, uh, you can find it there if you want to uh, watch the recording. So they are always available to you. You can go and look at the, any of them that you missed or if you want to re-watch re something, it's all there available to you. Again, please just, just uh, keep this, um, amongst members if you don't mind because this is a, intended as a value add just for members and if somebody wants to watch it then maybe they should become a member hey eh? how about that uh comment from andrea kellett thanks a lot michelle ah, i've always appreciated your real live workable examples and solutions take care thanks nice, andrea. nice. well 
Well, um, I just want to say thank you because I can see my team's just coming on board so you'll hear the background noise. I want to tell you, cost-wise, I would rather think a little bit and send you something by email that you can maybe share to members. Um, just so it's a bit more accurate than me just doing a thumbs up. But thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Michelle, thank you so much. It's been very, very helpful and very interesting. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks everyone. Have a good weekend. <laughs> Bye. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye.